York City early last year. The IRA's top man in the United States makes a journey into the heart of Manhattan. He's on his way to a luxury hotel off Fifth Avenue. There, he's to have a clandestine meeting with an underworld arms dealer. The dealer is offering the IRA man the one thing his masters in Ireland most desire, surface-to-air missiles that will knock out of the skies British helicopters and aircraft. But he's about to make the biggest mistake of his long career. He's about to walk straight into an elaborate trap set up by the FBI. This is to be the crowning moment of a three-year war by America's Federal Bureau of Investigation against the IRA. Who is it? This is the moment when they got their man, trapped on videotape. Yet victory has brought only controversy in its wake. Critics are now accusing the FBI of acting politically, of spying on and arresting Irish Americans because of a secret deal with a foreign government, Britain. Controversial, too, because the operation involved the use of so-called dirty tricks, which had previously landed the FBI in hot water. And there are even claims that the CIA is behind the gun running. Have you, have you seen that before? No, I didn't see the actual one before. I didn't okay. see this before, right? This, you know this, sir. That's an angle. That's an angle. Today in New York, a jury is considering these dramatic secret videotapes of an IRA arms buying operation. World in Action has obtained the tapes. Tonight, we tell the story of the IRA's plan to bring the most frightening weapons yet to Ireland. And how they were stopped by an FBI operation codenamed Hit and Win. Ever since the Troubles began, America has been a haven for the IRA. It's been the biggest source of money and guns, safe refuge for IRA men on the run. New York, with its huge Irish-American population, has always been the center of Republican activity. Yet for years, the FBI has been powerless to do anything. Their own rules forbade them to act on information from the British about American residents, even when those residents were known IRA men. Then, three years ago, all that changed dramatically. Dick, I've got you is handling the surveillances. Frank, you're going to cover. Uh, the agent. No weapons leave the premises. No weapons leave the premises. Okay. As soon as the exchange is made, I'm going to want the arrest to go down. This is so the I'm FBI's provisional ask. IRA, or PIRA, uh, squad, a team of six hold. undercover agents. Hear, the squad was set up after a series of secret meetings between Britain and America in 1979, in a year which saw the killing of Airy Neve, Lord Mountbatten, 18 soldiers at Warren Point. The FBI changed their rules. No longer would they be neutral, they were to pursue the IRA with a vengeance. Uh, in addition to these, How many of these, we'll have 25 of these out. In addition to these, we'll have our sidearms and uh, the usual shotguns uh, in case there's some trouble. The Pyro Squad now plants double agents, pressurizes gangland leaders who supply the weapons, carries out phone taps and surveillance. Intelligence is now exchanged daily with the British Secret Service. This abrupt change of policy at the FBI's New York Bureau has created suspicion that IRA sympathizers are being targeted at the request of the British government. We have uh, evidence to indicate that there are operatives of British intelligence actually working in the United States, in the Irish American communities, contrary to American law, uh, who, and their job is to pinpoint and to uh, put names to people uh, who are uh, involved or sympathetic to the IRA, and they turn this information over to the FBI, and then the FBI achieves the objective of either trying to catch uh, the, these people with arms or, uh, in a better sense, trying to ensnare them into the purchase of arms from FBI agents. What's wrong with the exchange of intelligence information between two allied countries anyway, if people are Noth breaking the law? Nothing is wrong with the exchange of, of intelligence information. What's wrong is, is that a government such as our, my own will make a political decision to stop some people who are fighting for their freedom as they see it 
and choose not to stop others. In other words, it is a political decision. It has nothing to do with right and wrong. It has everything to do with politics. Nobody and the FBI is making no efforts to stop the flow of guns to Afghanistan, which is happening from the United States. And I dare say they make no effort to stop anything flowing to solidarity in Poland. That's ridiculous. I hear that charge more often than not. It probably makes me angrier than anything else. What we do is receive information from many sources, including our own. The charge is often made we work for the British government. What we do is receive information from many sources, including the British government. We check it second time, third time, and a fourth time. If it's good information, and the person involved is in fact breaking the law as proven by evidence obtained through our case investigation, he's gonna to go to jail. What would you have us do, throw it in the sewer? The opening shots in the FBI's war on the IRA brought them up immediately against this unlikely veteran. He's 68-year-old George Harrison, a former security guard and a committed IRA supporter. It soon became clear that since the troubles began, he'd been the IRA's main American arms buyer. But 21 months ago, Harrison and his associates were caught red-handed shipping these weapons out of New York. This was the first major undercover operation by the FBI's Pyra Squad. In the subsequent trial last autumn, George Harrison boasted openly of sending guns to Ireland for more than 20 years. A boast he repeated to World in Action when he agreed to talk on television for the first time about his activities. If it was in my power to uh, send a, uh, um, a shipload of um, weapons to uh, the Irish Republican Army tomorrow morning, I would do it. Are you proud of that? I'm very proud of it. How many weapons do you think you have shipped over there? Well, I uh, would prefer to let my... <laughs> it's the court records. Says I, I, I don't want to go into specifics of that. But However, I didn't send enough. I wish I should have, I should have sent a lot more. But we're talking about thousands of weapons over the years here, aren't we? Well, I would suppose, yes. Uh, and that's something you're proud of? I'm only sorry that I couldn't have done a lot more. Do you ever think about what these weapons are being used for? Uh, the weapons that, any weapons that were sent, uh, were uh, used to uh, defend the, um, the uh, nationalist people, a British occupied army against the British army of occupation. But weapons that you have supplied in New York here and sent over, they've been used to kill people. Uh, they've been used in, def in wars, people are killed. So if you had the money available now, you would send weapons? Oh, definitely. I would, uh, as, long as, the British, as long as there is a British soldier in Ireland, I, will, uh, I, would, uh, I would continue. Are you doing that at the moment? Well, uh, that I cannot answer at the moment. You know. I mean, I cannot uh, answer you that at the moment. But I'm sure I, the, the FBI, uh, the CIA, uh, the Special Branch in Dublin, the RUC, MI6, MI5, they know just what I'm doing. But in court last November, things went badly wrong for the FBI. Although Harrison and his associates admitted the gun running, their lawyers claimed they were put up to it by the CIA. Although this was vehemently denied, the smear of CIA involvement was enough to sway the jury. Harrison was acquitted. The IRA pulled off a major propaganda coup. Two jurors joined them in their celebration party. The FBI was shattered. Flabbergasted and appalled that this could happen even after it, they openly admitted in court that they had done everything that we charged them with. Well, and why didn't the jury convict them then? Once they introduced that defense, it was no longer a case against the IRA. It was whether or not you were going to believe the CIA. And, as I said, the residue from Watergate is that people will still not believe that CIA is not involved in everything in the world. For the FBI, however, the Harrison case wasn't the complete disaster it had seemed at the time. As part of their secret operation, agents had tapped the phone of George Harrison. In one conversation, they'd heard him mention a new name, that of Gabriel McGehee. Little could be found in the records about McGehee, a cautious, secretive man. Our concealed camera tracked him down to a fashionable restaurant in Manhattan, where he works each night as a barman. He's 43 years old, Belfast born, came to New York in the mid-70s, and has since asked for political asylum to avoid deportation. In the late 60s and 70s, when Ulster's violence was at its height, Gabriel McGehee worked as a stevedore at Southampton Docks. He was, say police sources, one of the most important IRA men outside Ireland. 
By his influence within the large Irish workforce in the port and his knowledge of ships, he became the main conduit by which arms reached Ireland from America. Yet no evidence could be found to arrest him. Only the chance discovery of an IRA bomb factory in Southampton in 1974, which ended with the shooting of a young police constable, forced the police to act. McGehee was served with an exclusion order, banning him from Britain. The IRA simply transferred him to New York. What did the FBI know about Gabriel McGehee? Our friend Panicky, which is what we used to call him. He was the number one para man in the United States based in New York. We knew that because we know that he won a power struggle between the old line IRA establishment uh, represented in its ultimate by George Harrison and, and the new hard line violent killer type revolutionary represented by Gabriel McGehee. Why did you call him panicky? Because he was so uh, surveillance conscious and professional in the way that he handled himself uh, during the course of our investigation of him. Uh, we conducted many, many surveillances, both electronic and physical of him. There are times when we surveilled him throughout the streets going to various meetings. Uh, he would walk backwards, go in and out of subway cars. The French Connection type individual. And what was his job here, do you believe? His job here, without question, was to get bombs, guns, ammunition, blasting caps, SAM missiles, anything that would kill and send it to Ireland for the IRA. But however careful McGay he was by nature, there was one glittering prize for which, say the FBI, he was prepared to throw caution to the wind. large parts of Ulster's border areas, the army is barely in control. Such as the IRA's grip on the countryside, the army can move safely only by helicopter. The roads are too dangerous. In isolated country posts like Crossma Glen, even the refuse has to be taken away by helicopter. To be able to shoot down one of these helicopters would be an enormous propaganda and military coup for the IRA. For the army, it's an alarming prospect. It could give the IRA effective control of large parts of the border. But to do it, they need the one thing they've never been able to get their hands on, a surface-to-air missile, or SAM. It was the IRA's longing for a weapon such as this that gave the FBI the break they wanted. In early 1982, this man walked into the FBI's New York office. He's Michael Hanratty a small-time electronics dealer. He'd been supplying electronic equipment to be used for detonating bombs to the IRA. Then one day, McGehee's men asked Hanratty if he knew anyone who could supply surface-to-air missiles. When Hanratty revealed this to the FBI, they saw a chance to penetrate and destroy the most important IRA cell in America. An elaborate undercover plan was drawn up. Operation Hit and Win was underway. Secret cameras and microphones were installed by FBI technicians in an office suite in New Orleans. To this room, two of McGehee's men were now lured by the promise of a meeting with Luis, a shady Latin American arms dealer. They thought he was there to sell them missiles. Luis was, in fact, an FBI undercover agent. It's not the first time the FBI has used so-called dirty tricks They've been widely criticized for using agent provocateur. It's claimed that they induce people to commit crime. The FBI is unrepentant. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. If they're predisposed to get involved in gun running or any other criminal activities, then uh, the placing of double agents or anything like that in their midst to gain first-hand information and evidence is not, in my view, in any way illegal. So you justify all these methods? Oh, absolutely. World in Action has obtained exclusive copies of the dramatic videotape evidence now being shown to a New York jury. For the first time, they show remarkable pictures of an IRA arms-buying operation. McGahey has sent the two IRA men who are seated on the settee. Luis, the FBI man, is at his desk. Also in the room are Enrique, 
Luis's assistant, and Bill, his weapons expert, both secret agents. Luis starts the dealing. What can we do for you? Private service to Aramis. What can you carry? I'm sorry. Service to Aramis. Can you carry service to Aramis and Sam's? All right. Uh, are you? What are you? I said, uh, you're talking about uh, for, for uh, uh, what, what for? Are you talking about shooting that airplane? Yes. OK. Oh, you know a, a, are you familiar with the red eye? Yes. OK. Is, is this what you're looking for? Red eye or the, um, the sound? Luis, the FBI agent, now tries to pin down the IRA men on why they want the red eye missiles. Very, 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 very point blank. Please do this. Assignments only use one thing. All right? What What do you have? What What is your intention with Sam? Well, I, that's normal use. Tell me. What is me for? What is me for? Okay. Okay. Good. Good. On the air. Yes. Right. Right. Aircraft. Yes, sir. Exactly. Right. The re reason we're asking, some people will ask for these things, they're really not wondering what the hell they're talking about. Right now, you... Sorry, just before we go, yes. uh, make this clear. Please. What we want is a weapon which will take down, at least take down helicopters, choppers, All right. uh, warships in the sky, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So uh, can we take it from there? Yes. Now the secret agents try to find if the IRA men have authority to buy the missiles. Well, I can assume you know, you, we have authority. We know what we're talking about. If this man passed a few minutes ago, we were young. Okay. We might look young, but... No, no, we're not going to yeah. insult you. We have a lot of ability and experience behind this. Me wrong. Oh, sir, we're not well, insulting we you, okay? okay? Please something. understand that. Yeah. yeah. Okay? We're here to do business. Okay. We're here for hardware and we're prepared to pay for it, right? Okay. We're only haggling here at the moment to see what each side has got. That's all it is to it. Okay. It's just simple, yeah. a business transaction. So, can we get on with it, please? Yeah? Okay. We intend to buy if you produce. And so a deal is made. Give us, a, give us an, an order. We, I'll give you an order. Five, you want five, orders. five red eggs. No problem. Uh, uh, five red eggs. Okay. Well, we come down here with the intention of a $50,000 deal. Okay. $40,000, $50,000. All right. So with the IRA agreeing to buy five red eye surface-to-air missiles for $50,000, the undercover agents then show off some of the other weapons they can supply. Put this stuff in. Is that the rapid fire room? Yes. It's MP5 SD. Rapid fire? Silence. Follow me. Can I see it now? Sure. Clear, please. Clear. Okay. Don't point it here. Oh, sorry, it's not for us to clear it, but you're pointing at this one. Have you, have you seen that before? The arms dealing becomes almost absurd when both sides contemplate firing the weapon into phone books. Maybe you need more phone books. Okay. Can we do something? Oh, boy. Realizing that the bullets may go through the floor into the public bar below, they drop the idea. Yeah, With the meeting drawing to an end, the FBI agents are able to coax the two men into admitting just who they represent. Who do you represent? Let me, let me ask you one thing. Who do you represent? Do you ever tell the provisionals? Yeah. Are you from Copenhagen? All right. That's who we represent. Both sides agree to meet again in two weeks' time to complete the deal. Meanwhile, in New York, the FBI get a breakthrough. The Pirate Squad had been keeping 24-hour surveillances on McGahee and his associates. By chance, they now stumbled across the last stages of another operation by the same IRA gang. McGahee's associates had been seen loading boxes onto a container lorry. The FBI trailed the lorry to a dockside just outside New York. From there, the container was due to be shipped to Dublin. The FBI decided to take a closer look at it. In the boxes, wrapped in silver foil, were 51 assorted guns. Smith & Wesson 38. The FBI also found several thousand rounds of ammunition, 55 explosive devices, and several radio transmitters that could be used for detonating bombs. But finding the weapons posed a big dilemma for the FBI. If they arrested any of McGahee's men now, the rest of the gang would run for cover. The missile deal would be off, 
and the chance of catching McGahey himself lost. So later that day, the container was secretly repacked, the ship allowed to sail for Ireland. Dublin police were tipped off to await its arrival and arrest whoever came to collect the container. What the FBI had done was to buy time, a few days in which to finalise the missile deal and get enough evidence to arrest McGahey. The final meeting with the IRA was now hastily arranged at a New York hotel. Once again, secret cameras and microphones were in place. The FBI hadn't known who to expect, and to their astonishment, a different face now appeared on their video screens, that of Gabriel McGahey himself, forced to break cover in his anxiety to pull off this, his most important deal. But I am... Sir, well, you are there. Well, I'm the... I'm the... Well. He made the big mistake after all the surveillances, after all the trouble that we had surveilling him and detailing his activities, for him to finally walk in, talk to an undercover FBI agent on camera with microphones rolling, stating that he was the number one man in the United States, and I think those were almost his exact words, uh, the feeling in the next room where my agents were uh, was one of ecstasy, uh, to the point where we're almost leaping from the pipes. Okay, who is on top of you? In this country? Yeah, nobody. You are the one that, that has that final decision. Nobody in this country. In another country? Yes. We have what you are interested in. Mm -hmm. Providing that the prize is the same one, $10,000 apiece for each red eye missile. Right. We will handle the delivery. McGahey is suspicious that he might be walking into a police trap once he takes delivery of the missiles. Hey, you're gone. Tuck's hit. Money gone. Missiles gone. Man gone. The only one to lose is us. McGahey comes up with a remarkable plan. Both sides should take hostages who will be killed if anything goes wrong. There's only one way it can be done. It's very simple. I myself will personally go as a hostage. Mm -hmm. Personal. Mm -hmm. Wherever you want, I'll sit with whatever you want against it. one that I might want. Because everything's clean. Mm -hmm. Right? And we sit in the exact way, the same way. Because the one thing I know, if I'm going to jail, somebody's going to die home. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, that's a problem. We, we have a problem with that. And, uh, uh, that I mean, it's only a safeguard. Right? See what we're doing here. What is happening here with this? What we're dealing for here at the minute, money wise, is chicken. It's nothing. That's right. It's nothing. That's right. That's, right. that's our problem. Right. Our problem is this. Once we. Pick the first one, right? And it is a sign to We build the relationship up. Then we prepare to come with a lot of big money. But McGahey's threat to kill the hostage puts the deal in jeopardy. You're saying that you will not go along with anything unless it is having a guy for 12 hours. Is that it? That's it. And the reason so that is, as I say, it's basically based on you mistrust me, I mistrust you. Because of, we will both have a long time to think about it where we're wrong. And I don't particularly want to be locked up, neither is any of my men. And the only way we can, if everything is in good faith, there is no reason why, for instance, there's no reason why me and you can't sit down and let the whole deal go down. Let the whole thing go down. Let the whole... You sit with me. Yeah. One of my men sit with one of them. Sit. Have a... I don't know what the orange juice is done. As long as we're sitting here, but I know one thing sure. That if any of my men get nicked, you're dead. Mm -hmm. If any of your men get nicked, the guy you have is dead. Mm -hmm. At least we have some sort of. I mean, if I go to jail, mm -hmm. I'm going to know somebody's going down. McGahey was arrested shortly afterwards. Now he and three associates are at a New York court standing trial. McGahey is facing six arms smuggling and conspiracy charges. Six more members of the gang, including the two who tried to buy the missiles, are on the run. Now, as the trial enters its fourth week, the verdict is anxiously awaited by both the FBI and the IRA. Following the shock acquittal of George Harrison in the first gun-running case, governments on both sides of the Atlantic fear that an acquittal this time will mean the flow of arms can never be stopped. Even now, the FBI admit that on the streets of New York, a new man has replaced Gabriel McGahey. 
and that preparations for another armed shipment are already underway.